How's everybody doing today? Good, good. I am uh, Eric Dewees. <clears throat> I am an assistant professor of English at SMSU. Uh, this is my sixth year. Um, and um, just want to thank a few people before I get started. Uh, I want to thank Paula for setting up this. She always does such a great job at these library events. Um, and um, this is actually a series that is hosted in the history department. So the history department is allowing me to kind of crash their party. Um, so I'm appreciative of that. Um, and then uh, if any of you know uh, Marcy Olson, Joan Gittens, they've also been really instrumental in helping out. Also, my wife has uh, been very patient with me uh, running ideas by her. And she's actually had a few ideas. And I'm I think I remember the one or two. And I'm going to make sure I credit you. But if I say something and you said it, you should raise your hand because I want to make sure that that you get credit for those. Uh, yeah, and also, so I, I think also the idea of what we English professors do is sometimes uh, maybe a little misunderstood, even sometimes within English. There's like these warring ideas about what English professors do. Um, but in my PhD studies, half of my coursework was actually in film studies. So not every English department has a lot of film studies. Um, but it's not uncommon to find them, um, and yeah, so in case that clears up any confusion for you. Um, so let's get started. Here's what we're going to do, um, and if you have questions in between, please let me know. Um, shoot your hand up, start talking, whatever, we'll figure it out. So we're going to talk very briefly about 1968. Um, we're going to talk about this term reflexive, what it means, and then we're going to get into these three films. One is Weekend, this is a French film. Uh, Medium Cool is the next one, that, that's an American one. And then the last one's also American, and it is Symbiose Psycho Taxiplasm Take One. The name of that is going to get shorter and shorter and shorter as the presentation progresses because I'm gonna get tired of saying it. Uh, but, so this is kind of what you have uh, in store in case that helps you. Um, so 1968, um, most or all of us, I think, are pretty aware of just some of the general things that are happening in 1968, right? There's uh, quite, a, quite, a, quite a few protests, uh, rebellions, revolutions across the world, quite a bit of political upheaval, um, a fair amount of violence. Um, we have the Cold War, right? All these things are kind of happening at the same time. Um, and then there's also, um, perhaps because of, and perhaps also alongside of, some artistic innovation that's happening in the 60s, um, including 68. Um, and of course, some people see 68 as kind of the end of the 60s movement, um, just because there's a lot of disillusionment happening. Um, and then there's also this pushback um, against a lot of these movements. It's like, we've, we've gone too far, let's step back. Um, yeah, so that's what's happening right in 68, just as a reminder. Um, I'm not a historian, I'm not going to get into the specifics, but just so we're all kind of on the equal footing here. In film, um, we have a few things that 1968 um, is either witnessing or coming on the heels of. Um, so one, and I'll talk about this in a little bit more detail, some scholars argue we've got the end of the French New Wave movement, and that's going to be connected to our first film, so I'm going to save that a little bit. Some folks put the end of that in 71. Like all these artistic movements, I mean, pick a year within three to five and you're sort of correct, right? Um, we also have the end of the studio system in classic Hollywood recently. So I don't know if you're familiar with these at all. The studio system ends either in 1948 or 1954, depending on uh, what you want to mark as the end of it. Um, and just very briefly, the studio system is this time, it starts in 1927. And you have five major studios and then two smaller ones. Those five major ones control films from the beginning to the end. So they control the studios, the lots, all those things. They control, they own the equipment. They even have like directors and actors and actresses are signed to contracts. So it's like you can only make movies with us unless we loan you out. So if any of you keep up with professional European soccer, it's a little bit like that. Like, you're ours unless we decide somebody else can have you. And usually when they do, it's either because they can make money loaning them out or it's like a trade, right? Like, we'll give you John Wayne for this picture if you give us 
I don't know, whoever. Uh, so that's happening. That ends in, in 54, so we do have a little bit of a separation between that and 68. More recently is classic Hollywood, and in this, I'm using the term in this instance to refer to a style of making movies. So classic Hollywood is this very uniform approach to making film, and it still heavily influences what we see today. Um, I'm not gonna, I don't have time to get into a lot of detail, but it's basically there are some editing rules that have to be followed. Uh, there are narrative timeline rules that have to be followed. Uh, there is, you know, also tends to be certain kind of content that's off limits. Um, I'll give you one example. Um, there is, well, two. For editing, there's what's called the 180 degree rule and the 30 degree rule. So the 180 degree rule is, let's say, um, I don't have a marker, but let's say we're shooting something here from here, right? So 180 degrees is this. Your camera cannot go to the other side without preparing the viewer for that shift. And one way to think about the reason for this is, if I'm shooting here and a character's walking this way, and then in, the, in that moment I put the camera over here, all of a sudden it looks like they're walking in a completely different direction, right? So it's a way to make sure the viewers don't get confused. Um, to some extent, it's a little insulting, I think, on people's intelligence, but that's okay. And then the 30 degree rule is anytime I move the camera, I have to move it more than 30 degrees, right? So if I've got that same shot, 90 degrees, I have to move it at least 30 degrees at a time. And the reason is because if I move it, say, 10 degrees, it's so close to that shot before it, then the viewer's kind of like, it's like we just kind of skipped over, right? It's a little bit of an unusual cut. And that's called a jump cut, actually, if you do less than 30 degrees. And that's important because the new wave becomes associated, the French new wave becomes associated with that jump cut. So really the main takeaway for you is that we have had these really codified standard ways of making films in the U.S. and those within the last, you know, 10 to 15 years have come to an end. So there's a little bit of a void here in, but also a lot of opportunity in how people are going to make films. And then connected with that is the new Hollywood era. And that's actually connected to one of the films, so I'm going to save that also. Okay. But the big thing is, along with a lot of the political upheaval, we've also got some upheaval in the economic means of making film, the way we make film, and what kind of things we can make films about. Right? So those go hand in hand. All right. OK, so let's get to the French New Wave. So the French New Wave, I'm going to pick 1968 because number one, it dovetails very nicely with this presentation. Um, and we're going to talk about in a second here that what being reflexive means. It's a little bit of being honest. So I'm going to be a little bit honest with you as well and be reflexive in my presentation And that one of the reasons I chose 68 is it's very convenient for me. Some folks put it at 71. Uh, but the French New Wave starts out mostly as a group of film critics in France. They love film. They just sit and watch film all the time. I mean, just like this sort of encyclopedic knowledge, some of them, of film. Um, and they write a lot of their criticism in what's called Cahiers du Cinema. It's so just a film notebook, basically. Um, and those essays range from, like, some of them are, like, three paragraphs long. Some of them are pages and pages long. But they're just writing about the films that they, that they see. So it's, like, the most advanced, like, film club ever, basically. Um, and they see film as art. So they're saying film's not just entertainment, it's also artistic. And film can be just as important and can do a lot of the same things, not in the same way, but a lot of the same things that literature does, right? It can make us feel things and make us think about things, experience things. It's not just you pay your money, you sit, you watch something, you leave, and you're done. Uh, it can be, right? And they come up with this auteur theory, which is just means author theory, and they're basically arguing really good directors, artistic directors, they're basically like an author. They have styles that are owned, they cover some of the same ground, and they kind of control what's happening. Um, and they are known for stylistic innovation. So one of the things they are known for are jump cuts. And, but the reason that jump cuts come about is actually, so Jean-Luc Godard, who's the director of Weekend, which we're gonna see, his film Breathless, he makes this film and he makes it, it's just like way too long. It's a very long film. And, there, and it's just like you can't show this long of a film. 
he also has no money to go back and reshoot things. So he takes the film and he just cuts it up and he splices things together. And so what happens is out of necessity, he's creating jump cuts because when he splices them back, he literally is like jumping over shots and it's really obvious in the, in the uh, film itself. Um, the reason I put this at 1968 is Weekend, which we're gonna talk about. A lot of people see this as Godard's either his last new wave film or his first non-new wave film. And Godard is kind of one of the bigger uh, figures in the movement. Um, the French New Wave, by the way, are also at least partly responsible for elevating directors like Orson Welles, Citizen Kane, John Ford, who made all the Westerns, and especially Alfred Hitchcock. They say, look, these three directors, they don't just make good movies. Like, they're arts, they're artists, right? They've got these things going on. And in fact, if you're interested, Truffaut, who made uh, this film that we see the still from, um, he interviewed Hitchcock and produced this book of the interviews. There's just a documentary. And a lot of people attribute that interview to what really helped people realize that like, this is not just a guy who's just making entertainment. He's also making some really beautiful art. Uh, so that's the, the new wave. Um, so we kind of see that coming to an end, right? And we also have New Hollywood or what some folks call the American new wave. I put 1980-ish uh, because again, it depends. Um, so again, this is following the classic Hollywood studio system. We have a shift to young directors. Anyone want to know? Anyone know? Anyone want to guess why there's an emphasis on young directors? What te what other technology do you think is really becoming popular at this time? Entertainment technology. Television. Television. The more people watch TV, the less they go to the theater, right? And Hollywood realizes this, and they're like, "Look, if we don't get the youth crowd." Like, we're in serious trouble long term. So that's one of the reasons they shift to young directors, because like, hey, maybe you can make some films that'll bring these, this youth crowd in. And as part of that, you start to see things like there's more violence. Um, there are certain depictions of uh, you know, sexual behavior that all of a sudden you can show. But then there's also stylistic differences. So they are influenced by people like the French New Wave, but they're kind of in between. So they watch classic Hollywood, and they appreciate it. And then they also watch these really artsy things that you're never gonna make enough money off in the US to do. And they're kind of occupying the middle here, right? So Bonnie and Clyde is what some people attribute as the first uh, new Hollywood film. Uh, you also have things like The Last Picture Show. Uh, the Graduate is an example of that as well. One of my favorite movies of all time, Badlands, Terrence Malick. Um, I was very disappointed when I, when I learned it wasn't actually filmed in the Badlands, but that's okay. Uh, so, okay, so that's kind of where we are historically. Just, you know, if a lot of that washed over you, you're fine. You just kind of need to soak in the environment we're in, right? Um, I do want to have a disclaimer here. So this is about 1968, and I'm, again, I'm being honest. So Weekend is actually released in 1967 in France but it doesn't get to the US until 1968. So I'm gonna use that date. Really what's happening is I really just wanted to talk about these three films, and so I found a way to get them into 1968. Uh, Medium Cool is actually released in 1969, but it's filmed in 1968, and you're gonna see the, the footage that is filmed is very much 1968. Like, it is undeniably, sort of in its content, a 1968 film. Um, and then Symbio was filmed in 1968, and depending on what release date you want to use, there are a few we could use. Uh, there's 1971, there's 80 or 91, but really it doesn't get widespread release till 2005, right? So I was a little bit worried about this because this is a history series. These films only sort of fit into 1968, but then I realized time is a social construct anyway, so I'm just going to say it's 1968 and move on with it. This is something that we academics do sometimes. We're just like, ah, eh, I wanna do this. How do I figure it out? I'll make up a reason. One of, my, one of my friends in grad school said I used, he was like, I realized that what I wanted to argue, the opposite was true. And then I used my English academic mind and I made the opposite what I was arguing. So that's sometimes what we do. Uh, okay. So what is reflexivity, right? If any of you have studied a romance language, 
you've probably come across some reflex verbs or reflexive verbs, and those refer back to the, the subject. Um, so this is a, a quote reflect, and by Bob Stam or Robert Stam, sometimes he's referred to. Um, it points to its own mask and it invites the public to examine its design and texture. Reflexive works break with art as enchantment and call attention to their own factitiousness as textual constructs. That's a fancy way of saying that film, reflexive films, for example, are in part about the fact that they are a film. So you, you're constantly reminded that this is, a, not only is this a film, but like all these choices went into making this film. And so a lot of the movies we see now, and especially in classic Hollywood, the whole idea is it's trying to seduce you for like an hour and a half, two hours into thinking that what you're watching is real life. Even if in some part of your brain you realize it isn't. But a horror movie can only be so scary if you constantly remember that oh, I'm just sitting in a room in air conditioning or the heat, depending on the, su on the season, and eating popcorn and none of this is actually happening. On some level, you need to think this is actually happening, right? And reflexive films, on some level or another, are constantly reminding you that, no, this is just, somebody made this in some controlled surroundings and then chose how it was edited and put together, right? Um, this is not a term specific to 1968. Uh, I mean, so reflexive literature dates at least all the way back to Don Quixote. So that's 1615, right? Uh, and then even film history, behind the screen is the Charlie Chaplin movie, 1916. It's about the difficulty of making this film because uh, some folks go on strike. 1929, you have Man with a Movie Camera, which was made by a Soviet uh, filmmaker, and it's about a guy with a camera making a film. And then you're kind of watching the film that he's making. So this isn't new to 1968, but I think it does tell nicely with what's happening in 1968, and we'll kind of, we'll touch on that as we go along. Uh, so, okay, I think I've set the scene. Any questions on just the context? I'm going to fill in the details here as we go along. Okay, good, good. Okay, so this is a still from Godard's Weekend the first movie we're going to talk about. What do you notice? What do you see in this still? The warning is mine. The warning is not on the still. I'm going to talk about that in a second here. But. And you, you know, it doesn't have to be anything super fancy or smart. What do you notice? Tiger. Okay, there's a tiger. What tiger do you think that is? Oh, yeah, right. So it's Exxon, right? So it's an ad for gas. What else? Oh, uh, those are her sunglasses. sunglasses. Yeah. Lingerie. Yeah, lingerie. So there's this sexuality in the background there. Um, notice also the the female character is young. She's dressed like she's young, and then she also is looking right at us, right? Um, and so this is one way that reflexive films remind us that we're watching a film. Um, in most Hollywood movies like one big no-no is you don't look at the camera if you're an actor or an actress because it reminds the audience that there's a camera there, right? And you don't want that. So, and Godard uses this quite a bit. And in fact, in this shot, this woman is actually, there's no reason for us to see her here really in terms of narrative. She just put up there to remind us that we're watching a movie. I mean, there are some other reasons too, but that's one of the big reasons. Um, so I do want to warn you before we move on, weekend is full of car crashes. Uh, I want to say, I, I haven't done a count. My guess is at least 70% of on-screen time there's a wrecked car in the film. Um, there's blood. Now, it's pretty cartoonish blood. Um, Godard actually, it, when he was making another uh, gangster movie before this, a reviewer said, uh, why does there have to be so much blood in, your, in this film? And he said, red, not blood. Why does there have to be so much red? And it's because his blood is not particularly convincing. Um, but if you, you know, some people have different things that, you know, I can't handle watching brain surgery even when it's fake. I have to look away. So if that's a thing for you, just be aware that it's coming. Um, okay. Uh, briefly, the weekend plot, because we're not really going to talk about the plot much. We're going to really focus on the reflexive elements. So you have two main characters. They are Corinne and Roland. They're taking a road trip. Corinne's father's about to die, and 
they are romantically involved and they want to get the father's inheritance before her mother can get a hold of it. So their, their plan is to go to Wenville, which is this town where he lives, um, and get the inheritance before the mother can get it. Little do they know, both of them are having affairs and they both are planning on killing the other as soon as they get the inheritance. We never quite get that far, but that's the, that's the idea. Um, like I said, lots of car accidents, lots of arguments um, between them, between people that they encounter, and a lot of these are actually along class lines, a lot of the arguments. Um, even when it's like they have a perfectly good other reason to argue, they argue still about class. And then we end up with some revolutionary separatists at the end. We're not going to really talk about them too much. Um, they basically kidnap Corin and Roland at the end there. Um, but they're sort of revolutionary separatists who are also dressed very well. And, this, and, and throughout, Godard is criticizing, among other things, this growing consumerism in France. Um, so post-World War, just like the rest of Europe, you know, mid, at the end of the 40s, beginning of the 50s, the economy really picks up, and then all of a sudden, uh, people are buying lots of stuff. And in fact, I read that between 1960 and 1975, 1960, 30% of households in France had a car. By 1975, 60% had them. Um, so, to give you a little bit of an idea. Okay, uh, I'm going to show you this first clip. This comes toward the end of the film. And this is an example of a few things. Um, one, uh, you'll see that Godard is in, has no interest in moving the narrative along quickly. He doesn't care. And in fact, I, actually I should say, he cares about not moving it along quickly. And part of that is that he wants you to realize that what you're watching is a film. He, he, there, are, there are moments in other films where a character is bored, and the way he communicates that is he has this really long take where nothing happens so that both you and the character are bored at the same time, uh, right? So again, this is, does it really not blockbuster material. So, um, and then also you'll notice that you're being stared at this entire time, right? So I'm gonna let this play a little bit. So these are Corinne and Roland. Their, their car has been destroyed in an accident. They've hitched a ride with two garbage men and uh, they've stopped for lunch. And this is what uh, happens here. So let's see. If this will and it takes a little while to get going, but n'est pas non plus dû à la contestation chez l'ancien oppresseur de dispositions moins inhumaines et plus bienveillantes. L'optimisme en Afrique est le produit direct de l'action révolutionnaire, politique ou armée, souvent les deux à la fois, des masses africaines. Une grande partie de l'humanité a récemment tremblé dans ses assises les plus profondes devant le déterminement d'une idéologie. Le nazisme qui fit ressurgir les méthodes de torture et de génocide des temps les plus reculés. Le pays le plus immédiatement visé par les manifestations du nazisme se liguèrent et prirent l'engagement non pas seulement de libérer leur territoire occupé, mais de briser littéralement les reins aux nazis, d'estiper le mal là où il avait pris naissance, de liquider les régimes qui l'avaient suscité. Eh bien, les peuples africains doivent vraiment se souvenir His name is actually the extreme name angel. You can't see her, she's in the car, hitching with a woman named Mary Madeline, and his name is Joseph. So. Contester une vie hantée perpétuellement par la mort. Nous disons que nous ne devons pas faire confiance dans la bonne foi des impérialistes, mais que nous devons nous armer de fermeté, de combativité. L'Afrique ne sera pas libre par le développement mécanique des forces matérielles, 
This is uh, Sanjus. He actually, you're probably familiar with Robespierre during the Reign of Terror. Um, so, some, this guy, care this guy is playing some juice. He was uh, a sidekick of Robespierre. He was beheaded with Robespierre. Um, but that character later plays a man who is driving a Porsche and singing to his girlfriend in a payphone. And so this is one of the Godard. One of the things he criticizes here is the French Revolution. Like, what did it actually achieve? We basically kind of got the same people in power. I mean, yeah, the government structure changed a little bit. And you notice, so this is the Bourbon flag uh, discarded there. So I'm going to see if I can advance it. Sometimes PowerPoint doesn't really cooperate with advancement. So if it doesn't, that's not a problem. So you can see this goes on for another few minutes. And these, by the way, are speeches by actual like revolutionary figures. The first is by Franz Fanon. Um, and it's for a, an African revolution in the United States. The other is by Stokely Carmichael. Uh, he's addressing something in uh, Havana, a group in Havana. And you can see if you're bored, you're not the only ones. Because these two are like, when can we get to one view? They, right? And so you can see it just kind of keeps going and going and going. And, uh, you know, can you imagine like buying a ticket to this and not knowing what it is and showing up like, this is not what I signed up for at all. Um, but the whole idea is you're supposed to feel uncomfortable. You're supposed to feel like, okay, when are we going to get going here? When are we going to move along? And so you're being stared at. You're being stared at by the person who is not talking. Um, so you're, all, you're reminded that this sound is coming off screen. So it doesn't feel natural. And then every once in a while, the, we get this sort of, like, you know, you get the exterminating angel, which is kind of like what we expect out of a film but then it brings you right back to it. And when it brings you right back to it, I don't know if you noticed, but the music is competing with the speech, right? So you, you've got these two different levels competing with each other. Um, so you're supposed to feel like, why is this happening? Because that reminds you that you're watching a movie, right? So is the narrator talking to the people who are in the film or talking to I mean, I think you can certainly, I don't know who else they would be talking to. I mean, it's a great question. And so I think you can certainly say that they are. And it, the question is, if they're not, then who, who are they talking to? They're just giving political speeches to this empty land, right? Um, so yeah, there is a lot of this addressing the, the audience directly as well um, in there. Um, and part of what Godard's trying to do here is, he says it's not enough to make, revolution, to make films about revolution. You have to make films in a revolutionary way. And this is, for him, you know, one of those ways. Um, so let's go to the next one. This is the most famous scene from this film. This is sort of the beginning of the road trip. We're kind of jumping back toward the beginning of the film. Um, I'm not going to play you the whole clip, but I'm going to play you enough to where you kind of get a sense of what's happening. Um, Notice the sound, notice the setting and how it conflicts with what's happening. Just kind of see what you pick up on. This is Corinne and Roland in this car that's coming into view here.
This car right here, by the way, is sort of like the, the Beetle of France. It's the Du Chevaux. Okay, this is my favorite moment of this. This goes on for nine minutes. <laughs> Wait for it. Like, how did that white car get there, right? There's no reason for that to have happened. <laughs> okay, so what are some things you pick up on here? Just what it, you know, it doesn't have to be just whatever you saw well, or heard they're or. Traffic plane just yeah, <laughs> throwing the ball. So, yes, it's right there. Yeah. It's right there. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it seems like they're here for quite a while, right? They've hunkered down. Part of that is, is tourism grows quite a bit along with car ownership. And so all of a sudden you have these really idyllic, you know, fairly isolated roads that are just inundated with people. Um, what else? Yes, nonstop. We're going to come back to those with the, the next film, by the way. But yeah, it's, it is not pleasant, right? It's a... I mean, you can imagine the headache. I mean, you can understand why they almost get in a lot of fights, right? Because it's just like that noise would drive me to violence too, probably. Uh, anything else that you pick up on? I mean, you sort of wonder whether it's the destination or the experience. Yeah. It looks like they're just like out for a picnic and everybody's in the line. And maybe it's just the experience and not that they're going anywhere. Right, yeah. And, and that's a great point because the whole point of a film, we generally think, is what are we going toward, right? Especially in classic Hollywood, there's a, there's a storyline, there may be two or three, but if there are, they're all going to come together and they're going to be resolved, right? And so that's like kind of Coran and Roll-On, but everyone else is just like, oh, we'll just hang out and see what happens, let's have fun. Doesn't matter where we're going next. The landscape right? isn't very appealing. Yeah, it, there's not a whole, I mean, it's just sort of, it's not the most picturesque area in the world, for sure. Where did the kids come from? Hmm? Where do the kids come from? I don't know, but did you notice the kids are moving faster than the cars? Because <laughs> <laughs> I was late, I might, I, I probably missed a uh -huh. But the one car is progressing just fine in the other lane. Mm -hmm. And then I was going to comment, even though, as uh, Thomas Watson pointed out, some people just seem to be there for the experience. Other people look like they're really going someplace. Yeah. They are back to the hill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's a great point. So the, the two main characters are magically able to drive past the traffic jam, right? And this, I think, in some way is sort of a reflexive moment because films are sort of that way that, you know, every once in a while it's like, well, wait a second. Why, why, why are the characters we're watching just happen to be able to do this while none of the other characters can? And, uh, and, and Godard is sort of pointing out how absurd that is with this incredibly absurd scene, right? Um, that that method of storytelling, if we, really, if we stop and think about it for a few seconds, it doesn't make any sense, right? Well, I took it that that car is going in that lane, and that's what mm -hmm. all the honkings, they're trying to get ahead of everybody. Some of them are, I think. I think that's true. Um, the question is, like, they seem to be more successful than everyone else is, who, who is trying that. There are some who aren't, and then there are others who are. Um, and they just happen to be able to do it better for some reason. So maybe I'm going to stand reflective. The fact is, it's reflective because I get to, I get to reflect in, in pretty much my own experience and understand what I did and what Um, I mean, I think that does happen, but I think maybe that happens with other kinds of films too, possibly. But I think it's more the idea that the film is kind of reflecting on itself. Okay. So, you know, these characters can magically get to where they're going, and that's absurd, and I'm going to show you that that's absurd, right? 
uh, that's a big part of it. The other is this long take. So the long take, more cuts mean, right, so if we go from one shot to another to another to another, as long as it doesn't move too fast, we don't have a lot of time to think about the fact that we're going, you know, it, so if we have to continually process new information, then we can't think about what the camera is doing, right? But this long take allows us to really sit and absorb things and think about things. And also, I don't know about you, but I have never in my life been able to just sort of float on by a field, you know. Um, and so that experience also, it allows us to kind of sit and think about, hey, wait a second, what is this film doing? Right? And in asking that, we're reminded that we're watching a film. Um, and also, you know, the road trip movies or cars are, are fairly important in a lot of movies. It really helps people to shift scenes, shift locations. Um, yeah. Okay, I'm not going to show you the rest of it. Just so you know, the other thing I find interesting, and Sarah pointed this out, uh, um, is that you, you think that you've gotten to the cause of the traffic jam over and over and over again, but then it turns out there's another cause. Right? And that's also kind of, it's distancing you because you think you figured out what's happening and then you haven't. And then it gets kind of aggravating after a while, right? And that's sort of the point. You're supposed to feel aggravated. It turns out there's actually a really gruesome car accident at the end. Like one person's body's been cut in half. And, uh, but again, it's sort of this cartoonish, like if a person's body had been cut in half, it would not look like this. There's a very clean kind of, if, if, if a person being cut in half can be pretty, this is it. Uh, and then they just go into the, you know, the next scene. Um, okay, and so I'm gonna show you uh, just a few clips here of some car accidents. I don't have anywhere near the number of car accidents that happen, but. This one, by the way, um, the one with the explosion, a body emerges from it and is on fire and you hear screaming and you think it's the body, but it's actually Corinne and she yells because her Hermes handbag has been burned in the car accident. And I don't know if you know a Hermes handbag, but they are not only expensive, they're sort of impossible to find. Um, and then there's also one, we'll come back to it. Uh, it's all these, this one, all these jerks are dead. They're trying to get directions and all the people they come across can't give them directions because they're dead. He's like, oh, these jerks are dead. Um, and then there's also another one, I don't know if you notice it, but there's an airplane in a tree and it is in an accident with two cars. One of them is like flipped up, see? Yeah, so again, these accidents, not only are there just all these cars everywhere, but some of them are just so totally absurd um, that they're kind of ridiculous. Um, so that isn't necessarily reflexive. I just wanted to get you, give you an idea of, of what this film looks like. Um, a few things that I, that I don't talk about that are reflexive in this movie. We've got the long takes. We've got the characters staring at you. Um, we've also got uh, some, we saw some illusions. There are more illusions, but they are sort of just ridiculous illusions. Tom Thumb shows up and Emily Bronte, just in the middle of the woods. They just show up and, and they try to ask them for directions um, and they're not very helpful. And then Roland says, this movie's terrible while we meet are crazy people. Uh, and they comment on how they're characters and, and Corinne says, oh, well, I mean, we'll, we're sort of characters too, aren't we? So there's also a good bit of dialogue that's constantly telling like, oh, you're watching a film, you're watching a film, you're watching a film, right? Um, and so I think in connection with 1968, again, what's happening is Godard, he originally is just trying to make like innovative films. But at this point, he decides that's not enough and he's got to make revolutionary films. Um, and um, he very much, he swings way far to the left. Uh, so far that he actually, uh, as I understand it, becomes sort of an admirer of Chairman Mao's cultural revolution, which if you know anything about that, is a pretty horrific moment in history. Um, so, so he's trying to find these sort of, uh, these revolutionary ways of making film and he decides that the only way you can do that is to make an honest film. And the only way you can make an honest film 
is to remind people that they're watching a film. In fact, he's famous for saying the only honest film would be a camera filming itself in a mirror. Right? Um, absolutely no one would watch that, probably. So this is about as close as he can get. Uh, so, you know, that's just a brief touch on weekend. There's a whole lot of other stuff going on there, but I want to make sure we have time to get to these others. Um, so the next one we're going to talk about is Haskell Wexler's Medium Cool. This is the, one of the original movie posters, which I love. I think it's a fantastic uh, movie poster. And I want to show you the opening scene here. And you're going to notice a very familiar sound at the beginning. Oh. Now, when I recorded this, I tried to use the closed captioning, but for some reason the screen recording wouldn't record the closed caption. And what you miss is, it's hard to hear, but the woman just groaned. And so the, the main character in this is the guy in black. His name is John Katsalis, the character. Um, and he's a reporter, and then that, that's the, you know, the sound guy. The sound guy, by the way, was the, the doctor on the Bob Newhart show. Yeah, yeah. I just thought that yeah. looks like Jerry the dentist. That's him. That's him. <laughs> um, but they are uh, they're, you know, part of the media. And a lot of this film is about uh, media and the ethics of the media and the media's responsibility in a lot of the things that happened in 1968. Um, and so the way they help this woman is they call an ambulance and drive off. All right. Now, Katsalis does sort of redeem himself. As the movie progresses, he starts to realize that he is not, as he originally claims, just an extension of a machine. He actually is a human being who makes decisions, uh, that sort of thing. Um, so that's the opening scene. So Medium Cool is Wexler's first film as a director. He is an award-winning cinematographer. He wins the Oscar for cinematography for Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. It's the last time, actually, cinematography, you get both a black and white and a color picture. He also wins it later for In the Heat of the Night. He is a consultant on American Graffiti. And he actually has a very, he plays a prominent role in George Lucas going to film school. Um, he helps George Lucas get into USC film school. Um, so he's a pretty important guy. Uh, he, he also makes quite a bit of documentaries throughout his life, and this film combines documentary footage and fiction. What's interesting about this that you're going to see is it's not documentary and then fiction, but there are scenes, and we're not really going to get to see them, where he's filming the 1968 protests in Chicago and one of his actresses is walking through them, right? And these are right, incredibly violent protests, clashes with the police, blood, and she's walking through them as part of the narrative. John Katsalis attends the, the 1968 Democratic National Convention. We're gonna see a shot of him in it, right? So it's not, it's like they're all mushed together. Um, he was actually hired to make Concrete Wilderness, which by all accounts was this incredibly ordinary melodrama. And he was connected to the various 60s movements, so he had an idea of what was happening, he saw what was happening, and he just said, I can't make that film, I gotta make something about 1968. Um, and, and you'll see it, it revolves especially around the, the Democratic National Convention. It follows John Katsalis. He eventually meets this woman named uh, Eileen, who's a transplant from West Virginia to Chicago. He falls in love with her. She has a son named Harold, who's actually played by a boy named Harold, who was not an actor. Um, they fall in love, and then the sort of the really pivotal scene where Eileen is moving through those protests is that Harold sees them kissing and gets angry, runs away, and she's trying to find him. 
um, and, and they eventually team up to try to find him, and we'll see what happens at the very end. Um, but it did face uh, censorship. Um, Paramount hired him to make Concrete Wilderness. They were not very happy when they got medium cool. So they kept trying to, whatever means they could to keep it from being released. It was an originally rated X. Um, some people say that it's because there is some nudity in it, but a lot of people say it's actually because they filmed the 1968 protest and they filmed a lot of people saying things about police that were maybe didn't make a whole lot of people feel really comfortable. So that was part of it. And then later they tried to keep it from being released because he didn't get release forms from all the people he filmed. Like all the protesters, all the policemen, all, you know, all those people. Um, it eventually is released, but it doesn't really, it's mostly just makes all its money on rental later. But it is seen as a pretty pivotal, important film. Um, okay. This is in the, pro so we're going to start at the 1968 protests in this. We're going to then go to the DNC and then go back and forth. Again, this gets a little bit bloody. Um, you're going to see actual protesters who have been beaten, carted off. So just be prepared for that. So I don't know if you heard that but it was look out Haskell, it's real. That was actually edited in later, but Haskell Wexler said that was actually what he was thinking because he was there filming and that was a gas canister being shot at him. Um, so this is the DNC. This is Mayor Daley, right, Chicago. And this is actual footage and this is his campaign song, Happy Days Are Here Again. And there's, that's Katsalis. And this is something we get throughout the movie. We see the equipment that is responsible for making, maybe not necessarily this movie, but a movie. And it reminds us that what we're watching has got a source to it, right? It's got some machination to it. It's got some editing to it. Um, and then he also floats between fiction and documentary to keep reminding you that what you're watching is not real because then you get something that we would consider real, right? So he's combining those two together. Um, and you can see here also that we get, um, you don't get to see a lot of this, but throughout these protests, what you see again are media members taking pictures and filming, and then that's it. And one of the questions throughout this is, what is the responsibility of the media? Like, what are their ethics? Um, are they justified in just staying away? Um, and we get that with Katselis, because we see him and he's just looking at what's happening, right? Um, and remember, uh, I don't know if you remember, but at some moment, the representative from Colorado in the DNC calls out and, and basically says, Mayor Daley, when are you going to basically stop your policemen from beating these kids? Um, and, and we get that later in the movie. Um, and so it's a reminder that violence isn't just physical, right? It also happens in the political decisions that we make. It also happens in economic decisions. So it's concerned with that quite a bit. But the main reflexive thing here is the camera. We're, there's a camera all the time or recording equip equipment. We're always seeing that. And then we're also going back and forth between fiction and documentary and they blend together. Um, <clears throat> Okay, this is the final scene, so spoiler alert. Um, so this again, this is when, so Katselis and Eileen have met up and they're going to try to find her son um, and they're driving down this road. So keep an eye on, keep an eye on the, you know, what you're seeing, think about what you're seeing and then also think about what you're hearing. Um, and we'll see, hopefully this YouTube plugin will work. We'll keep our fingers crossed or I will keep mine, you don't have to.
<laughs> a friend of mine from El Paso, Texas was with me. Somebody threw something. He came up and said, did you see that? It was a cap or something. I said, no, and some cop says, okay, boy, what did you throw? And he pushed him. He said, what are you doing here? And he's out from El Paso, Texas. And then he pushed him into the crowd over here. They're trying to keep him contained. I guess they can beat him up later or something. That's right. <laughs> Just pass through. The police went in the room here. I don't think you're beating everybody inside. A line of policemen uh, has cut off the very front of the hill. There's mayhem in the street. The victim was identified as former Channel 8 news cameraman John Getzelis. Getzelis was taken to Michael Reese Hospital, where he's reported to be in critical condition. Cause of the accident is under investigation. A woman companion, not yet identified, was dead on arrival. People are being clubbed. And I mean in technical and in 3D, and they're crying and screaming. There's plenty of, I don't know that I've seen any blood yet, but I've seen some liquid on the ground. People are standing around and crying. What's your reaction to this girl with a McCarthy pin? No, no comment. Girls, girls, boys, people of every description are being grabbed and dragged into paddy wagons. What did you say? So notice that we get the report of the crash before it happens, right? And so again, uh, notice also how much this mirrors the first scene. Another melee is taking place in the park, right in front of the nation. Right in front of the entire nation, this is happening. NBC TV is right on the roof of the Haymarket Cocktails restaurant part of it. Uh, Hilton. Seeing these people being dragged into the police wagon. So again, we get to the ethics of media, and the idea here is that a film, media, etc., they don't simply record, they actually have an impact on what happens, right? And so it's almost like the radio report causes the accident. There's no real other reason for the accident to occur. We don't get any other explanation for it. Um, I also think it's interesting because the, when you hear the accident and then you get these views where you can't see through the windshield, and so it, in one sense, that sucks you into the film because you feel, I feel really anxious. Um, but, but then it interrupts that by showing you this camera at the end, right? So it sucks you in and then it pushes you back out. It distances you. And that distance is, is typical for reflexive film. Sarah pointed out, my wife, also that the, the windshield, you have the world being projected onto a screen, which is what a movie is, right? Um, what I love about this film, I think the end, that final shot, is, I'll be honest, it's a little bit hokey, but I also like it because the whole time the movie has been saying, you know, you media, it's not an excuse that you're just observing, that you have to consider your actions, your choices, etc. And then it turns that on us. Like, what have we been doing if we watch this whole movie? We've been sitting and watching the whole time and doing nothing else. So it also is like, okay, you don't get off. You know, you... You have to wrestle with your choices as well. So, um, okay, I'm going to move. We're on a, sort of running up against time, and so let me get on to Symbio. We'll try to move through this pretty quickly. Um, this is some Symbio Psychotaxoplasm, take one. Greaves is the man in the middle there. He's the director. This title comes from a what at the time, at least, was a, a term used in social sciences. I don't know if it's used anymore called symbiotaxiplasm. I am not a social scientist, but the best I understand it is it's this idea that if you are in a system or a community that you are connected to everyone and everything in it, and therefore everything you do impacts everyone in it, and vice versa. He added psycho because he also was interested with the psychological uh, as well. The take one, he had planned on making several takes along the same vein, but you know, it didn't work out. Um, I'm actually going to skip this clip, but I'm going to describe it to you since we're running out of time. So this is, they're in a field, and uh, they are talking about what this film is about. 
the production crew. And most of the film is actually the production crew talking to the production crew. Um, and they're like, what's going on here? What is happening here? You know, and, and Greaves basically just says, look, the whole point, it doesn't matter. All that matters is that we end up with something good, something creative. And this is Bob Rosen, who actually goes on to be a pretty successful producer. And he just says, I don't get that at all. I don't understand that at all. And Greaves said, doesn't matter. That's not the point. The point isn't for you to understand. Um, and that's kind of a, a, a snapshot of what happens a lot. So this is his first feature length. He's mostly a documentarian. He makes especially a lot of documentaries about civil rights figures like Ida B. Wells. Um, so in this film, there is a crew filming two actors in a test scene. The test scene has some of the worst dialogue I've ever heard in my life. It's intentional. It's intentionally bad. It's a couple arguing. The woman is accusing the man of being uh, gay and why does she, she, she argues that he keeps making her have abortions and he's just sort of your typical like, oh, why don't you ever listen to me? It is like, we've all probably had this argument 10 times and this is why you actually don't want to watch a movie that's about real life because it's really boring. Um, but he films this test scene with like four and five and six sets of actors and act actresses. He just over and over and over again. But he's got a crew, he is filming them, he's got someone filming him, and then he's got another camera filming everything that's happening. All right. So that's what's happening. We have a Miles Davis soundtrack, which is uh, unusual at the time, not unheard of, but jazz soundtrack, still fairly new. It's virtually unseen until 1991. He, it debuts at the Cannes Film Festival in 71. The projector mixes up the canisters. He shows it out of order. And for a film with no real narrative, like, this is really bad news. Greaves does admit later that he doesn't really think anyone would have really been interested in it, even if it had been shown in the proper order. But so it basically gets shelved. And then in 1991, uh, a retrospective in Brooklyn is made about him. And the curator sees this movie. She's like, I've never seen this movie. Where can I get my hands on this movie? And he says, you don't want to see that. And she said, no, I do. She watches it and she says, this is headlining. And it all of a sudden becomes this really important film to filmmakers. Steven Soderbergh, you probably know him from like Ocean's 11 and 12 and 13. He actually gets his start as an art, art house filmmaker. And he actually funds the next take, which is two and a half. Steve Buscemi loves it. If you know Steve Buscemi is right. So these people who really love film uh, love it. But uh, yeah, it's not really watched much. Um, these notes, by the way, are notes, Greaves writes these notes to himself about the film. And so I'm going to show you a little bit here. So they're filming in Central Park um, the whole time. So you, you get shots of just people going through the park. And that's one of the first things he says in the movie is, don't take me seriously. So you also get this. You will get all of a sudden, you'll get one screen, and then you'll get two, and we'll see even three screens at a time, and it'll just move back and forth. And just to kind of speed things up, one of the things he ends up telling someone is you're going to film everything that's happening. You know, if you see a car and you want to film a car, you film a car. Unless we need trouble, then come help us. And so it's this very like, he doesn't really tell people what's going on. He's just like, yeah, this is kind of your responsibility. Do what you want with it. Um, and it's because he actually wants there to be disorder. He, he writes in his notes that he wants there to be disorder in the making of the film. But we're, most of the movie is about making the movie. That's what most of the film is about. So that's enough. Uh, we'll move on here. So here you'll get to see the, the terribleness of the dialogue. Um, why, why are you acting so funny? Jonathan, you've got to come to the 
You're funny. You're funny. Stop. Stop. You're really a very funny Let's get the crew out, please. Yeah, you know, you, you really have the advantage. Why don't you just get out of my life, Betty? Why don't you just get out of my life? They want some fun. Don't knock them around. Stop acting. 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 I noticed that even the dialogue is about acting. Right? I'm not a mind reader. It would actually be nice if we could have a little more time to walk into it. This is what I like to do. I don't want you to stand here. No, if we're going to look as if. So they're just talking about the, the scene. Let's get the action. So I have fun, Toby. All right, we just had a jam in the magazine. So we get this a lot. There are production problems. We witness them, and then someone tells us we just witnessed a production problem. Right, so we get that quite a bit. Um, I want to show you one last scene from this. Um, and this is a conversation that happens among the, the production crew. And it's edited in throughout. Grease edits it in throughout. And this is one of these scenes. And then I'll wrap up. The film is designed to play. It's a film that's designed to, to reveal something. Notice also the way this Our conversation national. falls along gender lines. Mm -hmm. with these different, uh, with all this footage in the editing room according to how the film is edited. Because it's a type of film that you can edit in 300 different ways. Did you read the concept of it? No, I, no, I didn't read the concept of it. And I don't know whether we... The point is, I don't see where there's a beginning or a middle or an end. I don't mean in a sort of conventional story fashion, but everything we shoot is the same. Rather, right. let's be frank, in different actors, sort of uh, stage actors, not film actors, so they're all, which as I said, it would be great on Sony videotape and you could right. critique. But I don't see where there's any build in the film at all. Now you're getting out of any goodie. Every situation is not a goodie. Much is happening, if you ask me. I think there is. I think there's... Uh, excuse me, why... Why don't you think that... I think that... I think that... Yeah. It seems to me... You're not having right. your own part. Okay, go ahead. That, that, um, not having read Bill's concept, it seems to me there's some exploration of the levels of reality. Um, and the supra levels of reality. Okay, so this is even another level of reality that we're establishing here. And it may be the, the biggest put on of all time. That, that the second one. Recognizing the reality of, or non reality, trying to establish that is useless. For all anybody knows, you know, Bill is standing right outside the door and he's directing this whole scene. All right, it could be. Nobody knows. Maybe we're all acting. All right, maybe we're all acting. You know, I mean, I'm acting, you know. And that's it. I mean, I was, I was a Bill. Bill could have stood, stood outside of the door and told me, now, now, Rosen, when you get in there, you uh, 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 tell them about this. You know, when you get to a certain point, nobody out there knows whether or not we're for real and what is being revealed. My whole point is that nothing is being revealed, and that's the genius of this film. If there is a genius, I think the genius of this film was that it was provided that somewhere during its filming, the crew should decide to, to act as a as an independent unit, come into a room and talk about this film, and thereby possibly to change the end of it. That this was planned, consciously or unconsciously, by the film. You believe in God after all? No, I believe not. It's marvelous. So, first of all, notice how diverse the film crew is. Even by today's standards, this would be an incredibly diverse film crew. So, that act alone is innovative. Um, but I love this cut because he's like, maybe Greaves planned all this. And they're like, oh, like, what, do you believe in God? Like, basically, Greaves is God. And then you get this maniacal laughter from Greaves immediately. And it's because in his notes, he planned this. This is exactly what he wanted to happen. He said, maybe the crew will get together and they'll analyze the film and talk about all the problems with it and talk about, you know, how to make it a good film. It's exactly what they do, right? It's exactly what they do. Um, yeah, so not much of a narrative. It's mostly just people sitting around talking about the movie you're watching or making the movie you're watching or having problems making the movie you're watching. Um, and 
So for him, this film mirrors what's happening in 1968, that it's, it's a rebellion. He wants a rebellion because there are rebellions going on outside the film world as well. Um, so in part, reimagining filmmaking, but also it, uh, encouraging these rebellions, right? Um, so I just want to finish up here on sort of the limits of reflexive film. And I don't think I'm criticizing these filmmakers. I think they all probably were, to some extent or another, very well aware of the limits. So while reflexive film has its, its purposes, it does help us to kind of reimagine filmmaking and what ma watching the film is like and what our role as a viewer is. Um, it, it can only do so much as well. And I think it fails in a lot of the ways that some of these 60s movements ultimately don't quite succeed. So there, there is change, there is innovation, just like in some of these 60s movements. Um, but notice we're still talking about the directors. We're still, like, when we talk about these films, we talk about the people who control everything and edit everything and put it all together, right? So we're still, in, still trapped in that same logic in a lot of ways. Um, and also, this method of filmmaking just gets subsumed by standard filmmaking. I grew up watching Saved by the Bell. Zach Morris, every once in a while, will look at the camera and call timeout and then address the audience. They weren't making any sort of artistic statement. They just wanted Zach Morris to make some jokes. Right? Um, I was watching a, a commercial the other day, and Ice-T pops up and talks about how he's in a commercial and then disappears. Right? Um, a lot of these spoof movies, like Scary Movie, a lot of times they're, they're doing the same thing, right? And so, while in its day and age, maybe it's sort of, you know, revolutionary or innovative, I think at this point it's just kind of everywhere. Deadpool is just one giant blockbuster reflexive film, right? Um, so, it has its place, does some things, and still maybe can still achieve some things, but also kind of is limited in exactly what it can do. So that's all I got for you today. If you have any questions, comments, there are lots and lots of more reflexive films. I just chose a few of them for you. Your interest started with French, or are your interest started with this time period, or reflexive? It started with, well, so two things. In grad school, I took a 1960s film class. And then my dissertation involved some work on reflexivity. So I mushed them together. Yeah. I love, I love art that calls attention to itself. This type of filmmaking is still being made? I mean, I, I think now it's, it is, but it's not. I mean, yes, there, there certainly there would be. Um, adaptation came out in the 2000s. I mean, that would be an example of it. Oh. But I think now a lot of times it, it, you see it, I think, more frequently in like, things like Deadpool and, like I said, and things where it's really just, they're just using it to tell jokes, basically, a lot of times. Um, so it's used for a different purpose, I think. And, you know, there's the old adage that Hollywood loves nothing more than a movie about Hollywood. Um, so some of those, whether they're actually reflexive or not, I guess, you know, is any movie about a movie, is that necessarily reflexive? You know, that's a, an argument, I guess, to be decided. Can you give us some uh, movies of 1968 that we shouldn't have missed or should seek out? You know, I'm not, uh, I'm not very good with years. Uh, or that time period. But, I mean, so I was actually looking at some of the, the bestsellers. Um, I think Planet of the Apes was 1968. Um, the Graduate, 1967, but it goes into 1968. Um, that's another one. Um, yeah, I don't remember, I don't, off the top of my head, I don't have any others. Um, there's probably a pretty extensive Wikipedia entry. What's that? Straw dog. Yeah, see, I'm so bad with years. This is why it's sort of weird that I'm, the historians maybe are going to regret allowing me to take part in their series. Um, yeah. Do you think in some of those films you're talking about um, if they have soundtracks, mm -hmm. the music had a lot to do with it? Because there are movies yeah. that the dialogue has not held up very well over right. the years, 
but the soundtracks are right. still pretty good. Yeah, Medium Cool actually is something I didn't get to talk about. Medium Cool has music by Frank Zappa in it. Um, although there's, I found out today that the band that is technically playing that music is that was actually a Minneapolis-based band called Litter, I believe. Mm -hmm. I don't know anything about them. Uh, I don't know if they are, are of note any sort of consequence otherwise, historically. But yeah, some Frank Zappa um, in there. Um, and then the, you know, the Miles Davis soundtrack. Greaves chose that intentionally because he, he saw this movie as a lot of improvisation and also as a challenge to filmmaking, just as jazz was sort of this challenge to conventional ways of making, making music. Um, yeah. Weekend is interesting because its soundtrack is actually very conventional, um, as opposed to the, the rest of the filmmaking is not as incredibly unconventional. So, in fact, at one point there's a person just playing a piano in the middle of this town. I forget what composer he's playing, but it's a, you know, it's classic music, classical music. If I want to watch those three movies, uh, I don't know this guy who just presented on them. So, <laughs> the, just get familiar with the Criterion Collection. <laughs> uh, the Weekend and Symbio are both available for streaming on Filmstruck. If you get the Criterion Collection add-on, there is a free two-week trial period, so you could just sign up for that. Make sure you cancel before the two weeks are over um, if you want to do that. Medium Cool, it, I haven't found it streaming anywhere, just Criterion DVD um, is the only thing I'm aware of. So, yeah. And thank you for pointing out the uh, one actor was the dentist guy, yeah. Bob Marshall. I thought I was just nuts. No, 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 you are. And, and it's actually an important note because Medium Cool, Robert Forster, uh, who played John Katsalis, I forget what else he was in, but he had an, you know, an okay career. Um, Eileen was in a few things here and there. But it really, I mean, he probably had the most active acting career of everyone in the film. Too. Yes, he did. Yep, he did. Yeah. Uh, Symbio actually has a lot of those production, I mean, we don't know them because we don't generally memorize who produced what in their picture and all that. But um, a lot of those, the people on the production crew are, you know, if you can figure out who they are and go to their IMDb, IMDb page, that's super long. And in a lot of things you probably would recognize. The mustache guy, Bob Rosen, I forget what he produces, but he ends up producing some Films that are, if you could find the opposite of Symbio, Psycho, Taxiplasm, take one. Like, if there is an opposite, he produced a lot of those movies. I mean, they're just sort of like romantic comedies. And I, he probably produced some things that weren't just that as well. But, yeah. Okay, is that it? Well, thanks for coming. Thank you.